Um, yes, I'm Murray Lee. I'm a, I'm a physician uh, and I'm a founding partner in Habitat Health Impact Consulting. Uh, we're a small consulting company in Calgary that works a lot on population health, in particular in health impact assessment. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what health impact assessment is and how it ties in. Just a bit of a background as to that. And then Joyce will talk about a specific adaptation of health impact assessment in Calgary and, and possible future potential for health impact assessment in Calgary and planning. Now, I know I'm talking to a room full of planners, and I, I suspect that for you guys, the idea that place impacts health is kind of ingrained in the work you do. Uh, as a clinician, this was news to me. Um, in medicine, we tend to sometimes have the, the feeling that everything I need to know about you and your health, I can understand when you come to the clinic. I can ask you a few questions, I can poke on your liver, I can prod you a little bit, maybe take some blood, and that's all I need to know that the place from whence you came, that your world, your context, is trivia, it's irrelevant, it's just background knowledge. Um, so I trained to do rural family medicine, to work in remote uh, areas of Canada. I got the skill set I thought I would need, I learned my advanced cardiac skills, I know how to deliver a baby, I can suture things, I can fix stuff. And then I started traveling. I worked all around Alberta, worked in the Northwest Territories, Northern California, um, in New Mexico and in Arctic Canada. I still work today as a traveling physician in the fly-in communities of Nunavut. But over a decade of work in those communities, I slowly began to realize, like really slowly, that what I was seeing in each community was different. And it wasn't just who was in the place. There was something about the place itself. But I was working in a coal mining town in northern Alberta. It was different than working in a farming community of California. That somehow place affected health. And to me, it was an epiphany. Uh, so I went back to school. I went back to Berkeley specifically to study this stuff. And the first thing I learned was that I was an idiot, that, uh, which I think is probably what most of us learn when we go back to school. This isn't news. Um, you know, Hippocrates wrote about it. What I thought was a new idea is at least written down 4,000 years ago. Hippocrates said, that uh, to understand the diseases peculiar to a place or the particular nature of common diseases, you need to study and understand the place itself. I didn't know that. Um, you guys are probably more aware as a profession, I assume, about your own history. I was not. But the evolution of public health and modern planning simultaneously in response to the you know, overt health and social consequences of rapid industrialization and, uh, and urbanization in the 19th century. Um, this was all news to me. This was not something that I brought to bear in my work as a clinician and as a physician. And I think the fact I didn't really know much about this isn't just because I'm ignorant or that the quality of our medical education is shoddy. Uh, those are both true. I do teach medical education at the University of Calgary and, and it's probably not improving. Uh, but I think it is a sign, in addition to those things, of how far apart health and planning seem to have drifted. There's been a lot of work in the last 10 years to bring it back together, a ton of work in the built environment and health, a lot of the stuff I'm sure you guys know. I'm not going to teach any of that. I know as a physician we tend to have a bad habit of trying to tell people what to do, uh, to admonish you to eat more vegetables, uh, to not smoke, to exercise more. I'm not here to talk to you about how you can make planning more healthy. Uh, there is research, there is literature, and you guys know that as well as I do. What I'm going to talk to you about is specifically is health impact assessment, which is one tool that can be used to try to bridge the gap, to bring the evidence in the science of epidemiology, of population health, of health promotion, of clinical medicine, and to adapt it uh, for you guys, for the processes you use, uh, to the skill set and the expertise that you have. Uh, it's a developing field. It is, most of what you need to know is actually in the title itself. Uh, it is analogous to, it's the little brother of environmental impact assessment. It's a, it's a very little brother of, it might actually be the second cousin twice removed of. Uh, it's, it's a tiny little rump of the international impact assessment sort of world, uh, but it's developing. Probably the best definition of it is from 1999. The, um, and the key features in that definition, everything you need to know about HIA actually is there. It's a combination of procedures, methods, and tools. Um, so it is, it is both systematic but adaptable. There's a lot that can come into it. It's highly modifiable. It's not been around long enough to be ossified. And actually, the practitioners' health impact assessment love its adaptability. 
something we compare to environmental impact assessment. There is no one right way. So systematic, but adaptable. We can apply it to policies, programs, or projects. We look at potential effects. So this isn't actually looking at something that's already happened and trying to understand how health could have been affected. This is looking at something that is going to happen and how health might be affected and then how to adapt it. So it's to inform decision making. And in those potential impacts, we're not just looking at negative impacts, we're looking at positive impacts too, with the idea being how to mitigate harms and to enhance benefits. And then the final line too, it's not just looking at the health of population, but the distribution of the effects, the distribution of health. We know in epidemiology, and particularly social epidemiology, there are very few uniform uh, impacts on people, even something as, as uniform as heat. You apply heat to a community and you have a distribution of impacts is highly inequitable. Uh, health impact assessment at its core has equity uh, because equity itself is an impact on health. So a lot of that comes into the study and into the field of health impact assessment. It's not always done, but when it's done, the reasons are fairly clear. Uh, you want to identify harms and benefits before decisions are made to make for healthier policy or healthier planning. It can be part of the discussion of the trade-offs in a policy plan, project, or program. It's just one thing. People in the health world often think it's the most important thing. It isn't, but it's one more thing to bring to the table. It can help bring in evidence-based strategies. There is evidence, particularly in health promotion, as to what to do about some of these things. And it can bring that stuff into the planning process or into the development of a policy. And then it can really increase transparency, supporting inclusiveness, inclusiveness democracy, community engagement. Uh, in the states in particular, uh, HIA has been really seen as a tool for community engagement, particularly when you're dealing with things that are impacting vulnerable communities, and it's been used widely there. Um, and it, in some cases, people think that HIA, that that's its main value in some of these communities. And then it can be part of the shift of decision making to a more sort of multi-factor quality of life frameworks where health is one of the many things that's included. In some cases, uh, probably fairly rarely, HIA is done to meet regulatory or internal requirements. Uh, we do a lot of work in the resource sector and there are some resource companies where they actually have inter internal regulations requiring health impact assessment. And there are some places where the regulatory environment requires it. It's actually fairly rare. That's one of the other ways where we differ dramatically from environmental impact assessment. Uh, so it's been done in all fields. Uh, like I said, we've done most of our work actually as a company, mainly because we're in Calgary, we do most of our work in, in infrastructure and energy uh, and resource extraction. So we've done work on mines in Africa, we've worked offshore oil and gas in Alaska, uh, pipelines, wind farms, what have you. Um, there's been a lot of work around the world and we've been involved in some of it in the built environment as well. These are just some of examples. All of, this, all of these HIAs typically are publicly accessible and if you're interested to see what they look like on some of these things, you can look at it, things as diverse as skate parks in San Diego, looking at the injuries and the impacts on physical activity and community inclusiveness and crime and what have you, to bus rapid transit in uh, the East Bay. East Bay is one of the hotbeds of HIA, mostly out of Berkeley, particularly looking at vulnerable populations and underserved populations and where, how BRT might affect that. Uh, things as diverse as the Farmers Field NFL Stadium Development Proposal in LA and its impact on low-income populations and work and displacement to a policy around artificial turf use in Toronto and what are the health consequences and how might you change a policy around artificial turf use and how that could impact health. These are just some of the things that have been done and there's hundreds of examples. No matter what you do in HIA, there's typically five key steps. These are they. I'll just go over them briefly one at a time. The first step is obviously screening which is to determine whether the HIA is, is required or useful. Often that first part, is it required, supplants everything else. Sometimes you have to do an HIA even if it's going to be useless. Um, more often you'd like to do an HIA but you can't because uh, it's, not, it's not going to be, you're not going to be able to get it into the planning or, or the decision making process. So the issues around screening really are, is this thing going to impact health? And can, it be, can an HIA be used to inform decision making? Can you actually affect the decision making to improve the quality of health that results from it? Because again, it's key. These things that we're looking at are not things that are designed to impact health, but they just happen to. 
So if you screen something, it seems like it's right for an HIA, you can do it, then an HIA would be useful, then you move on to scoping, which is planning the approach. Often looking at the team, how it's going to fit into the decision making process, who's going to be involved, what health areas are you going to investigate. You try to scope broadly, so you don't cherry pick a few things. I want to see how this thing is going to affect that. You try to look at, well, how is this thing going to affect health writ large, both positive and negative. Try to set spatial and temporal boundaries, which can be hard with if you're dealing with something like a pipeline that's a thousand kilometers long. Who are you actually looking at the health impacts for? And then develop your assessment methodology or approach to stakeholder engagement. The assessment identifies and characterizes the potential effects, positive and negative, that are going to be associated with the project. Usually there's a big part of it that is actually trying to understand the baseline, what's going on in the community already, what are the health conditions, who has what, how is it affected. And then to look at these pathways you've identified, where might health be affected and what could possibly happen. In the assessment phase, you tend to use a lot of different tools. You use whatever you have available to you. Uh, a lot of it is non-quantitative. I think a lot of people who aren't in health impact assessment think that we're going to model everything. It's really hard to model some stuff. I mean, we know that if you build a mine in a remote community, that there's going to be an increase in chlamydia. We know that. But we can't sort of say, OK, well, what are the parameters of mine? How many workers can come in? Plug it into a machine and say there's going to be 32.5 new cases of chlamydia per year. We don't really have the models for a lot of what we're looking at. Uh, so models are used when we can, but typically it's effect characterization. How strong are the impacts? How certain are the impacts? What's the timeline of impacts? Uh, all so that you can come up with recommendations, which is the key of it. The only reason to do a health impact assessment is if you can make recommendations, suggestions as to what can be done. And often this is a very small set of specific and actionable things. It's not a yes or a no. It's not a, it's not a, a support for or opposition to. It's if this goes forward, here are some things to consider that you might not have otherwise considered. Here's the evidence behind them, and here's how you can actually make this thing work a little bit better. And then finally getting into evaluation and monitoring, both to measure the effectiveness of the HIA, how did it work, how did you do, how did your internal processes go, uh, but then to track the changes over time. As a new field, we lack a lot in this to try to understand what actually does happen down the road. Uh, it's hard to monitor things if you're making recommendations to prevent something. How do you actually measure the prevention of something? But it's a big part of one of the five key steps of HIA. It's diverse into how it can be practiced. It can be everything from a very rapid uh, desktop HIA, which involves little more than the manpower of the person doing it, uh, not much in the way of resources, no stakeholder involvement, very little if any new data gathering, just a very quick review of the health impacts of a policy or plan. To the intermediate, which is a little bit stepped up, uh, to comprehensive uh, HIAs, often which can be integrated into, into an environmental impact assessment where you're working with large teams in the community frequently, gathering new data, um, often primary data you're gathering. Uh, and it can take years and can cost a fortune. Our first HIA as a company was of a massive new um, oil sands project, uh, which took us years. Uh, and the project doesn't exist and probably never will. Uh, it's a great way to get started. <laughs> <laughs> the current state of practice, again, it's a field that's been around. People have talked about it for a long time. It, it sort of simmered for a while and then has exploded recently. There have been books written about it. Um, my boss, Marla Orenstein, who's also my wife, she's my boss in work and in life, uh, <laughs> really did write the book on HIA. Uh, there's professional organizations for health impact assessment. Uh, there's practice standards. There's more and more tools. Uh, it is an international field, a fairly close field. Uh, then it's working hard to make, to make the field stronger and better. Canada used to be a leader in HIA. Uh, in some ways, we still are. Uh, but the US has taken off. This is how many HIAs were known to have been completed in, HIA in the US in two, by 2007. There's 27 of them. There are a couple of hotbeds. California, particularly North Bay, around Berkeley, a little bit in the California as well. The uh, Alaska as well. There's one person in particular who developed HIA in the US, really promoted it. He was in Alaska at the time, and they were doing it. So you had these couple of hotbeds. Georgia had a few, mainly because the CDC is there. Uh, and then it just started to grow, again, out of those individual places. 
and then spreading across the country as the knowledge of it, as a skill set, as the education around it uh, started to work. By 2013, 238 had been done. Uh, and by 2014, which I think is the last year I have data here, is uh, 308. So a real explosion in the United States in the use of HIA. And in the U.S. in particular, built environment and transportation are the majority of HIAs that are done. So a third are on the built environment or issues around the built environment. Some of those examples I showed, other things specifically in transport. Um, natural resources and energy is another big hunk. That's, again, what we focus on mainly. And then agriculture, housing, education, these are more policy-related ones, labor employment and what have you. Uh, in the States, a lot of this came out of a, a national response and a national desire to promote HIA through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Canada hasn't had quite the same push. Um, there are people in Canada that are working through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, but in Canada it's taken a different sort of track. And there's a couple of places in particular. In Montreal, uh, they now actually have a health coordinator that actually tries to link population health and planning, particularly transportation planning. Around Toronto, there's a developing, uh, developing work, particularly in the Peel region, where there's a, a lot of work in HIA. And in BC, the health authorities and the medical officers of health have taken it on, and they're starting to promote it. So after leading for quite a while and then, and then lingering, Canada has really taken off, but it's very specific to the place that it's happening. So in a nutshell, what HIA is not, uh, it's not an epidemiologic study. We're not simply examining the impacts of something that's happened. It's not an advocacy piece. Uh, there's been battles. I've been at meetings for the last 10 years, in Oakland in particular, where, where there are battles around HIA's use in advocacy. Um, it can be used in advocacy, but it itself is not an advocacy piece. Uh, and it's not a health risk assessment. That's a whole other field where you're looking specifically at usually a, a small set of toxic exposures. Uh, that health risk assessment can inform health impact assessment, typically it informs environmental impact assessment, but an HIA is not health risk assessment. Key features of it, what it is, it looks at unintended effects. We're not looking at something that's designed to impact health, but something that just happens to anyways. We want to inform decision making. There's the five key steps and it's a systematic but flexible approach. Mm -hmm.